This lecture is uh, sponsored by the Wheatley Institution as part of our initiative on uh, family asset management. Uh, and uh, we're very pleased that Professor Sermons would take time out of a very busy schedule to come and uh, be with us this morning. C.F. Sermons is the J. Harold and Barbara Chastain eminent scholar in real estate at uh, Florida State University. He has also taught at the University of Connecticut, the University of Illinois, University of Georgia, and Louisiana State. He's published articles in numerous real estate, finance, and economic journals. Um, he has written, lectured, and consulted extensively on a wide range of real estate topics. He received his uh, bachelor's degree from Valvost Valdosta State College and his MA and PhDs from the University of Georgia. Would you please uh, welcome uh, Professor C.F. Sermons. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a privilege to be uh, with you this morning. Um, I left Tallahassee a couple of days ago. Uh, it was uh, 70 degrees uh, overnight. It was high 40s I get off the plane here and this morning it's 13 or some such thing and I'm saying whoa it's cold I've forgotten I've been away from cold weather for only two years and my blood is already pretty thin I, I appreciate the invitation uh, to come and uh, speak uh, this morning and to share a few thoughts about housing markets um, I appreciate that kind introduction I appreciate the Wheatley Institution for uh, for their support. Uh, I applaud them for their uh, mission, uh, helping people become better trained in financial aspects for those of us who've done it most of our lives. Uh, we understand how complex it is. I, I have yet to figure out the social security system and I have, I have tried on numerous times. Uh, I would prefer that they just give me all my money back and I wouldn't have to think about it anymore. But when you, when you get to be my age, you begin to think about such things. Today's topic is housing markets. Um, I, have some, I have some slides, I have some notes, I have some thoughts, I have some uh, uh, random synapses going through my head. Uh, I've tried to put some things down in some semblance of an order. I promised that I would try to talk only about 35 or 40 minutes, I cannot see the clock in the back of the room. I know there's a clock back there, but unfortunately it's pretty dark where the clock is. So uh, this is like sitting in sacrament meeting, you know, when, when people start uh, fidgeting a lot and the kids are headed for the door, you know it's time to quit. So uh, I've asked Professor Hill to wave at me uh, a lot when it gets to be uh, about 40 minutes, 35 or 40 minutes into this, because what I'd like to do is take some questions, if you have some questions. Uh, I will say some things about some issues, but there are probably some other things that perhaps you might want to talk about with respect to housing. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. So here, here's what I want to do. It's pretty simple. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a simple person. So I, I, I want to try to get you to thinking about how analysts think about housing markets. Um, I, I sometimes take it for granted that people know as much about housing as I do, and given that I don't know much, I suspect that they know a lot more uh, despite the fact that I've spent all of my professional career uh, the last 40 years almost studying real estate and housing markets. So, but, so let, me, let me see if I can get you to think like a housing analyst. There's a vast body of academic literature. You know, it, it is huge that covers the housing market. I, I just want to touch on a few things that I think are sort of interesting. Let me tell you a little bit about the current state of the housing market. We read a lot about it. Let me uh, try to see if I s say what you think the housing market looks like. With a little bit of global perspective, I'm not going to put much in. I have a slide or two about housing in other countries outside the U.S. Mostly I won't talk about the U.S. Talk a little bit about what I see as the possible future for housing markets in the U.S. And lastly, suggest how you might want to behave with respect to housing markets. 
the answer is buy low, uh, sell high. I mean, that's how you want to behave, but uh, doing that's uh, next to impossible. Okay, question? Yeah, the Wheatley Institution has the slides. They'll post them up for you. So, you know, don't, don't bother to write down a whole bunch of stuff uh, uh, unless you want to make notes writing a letter to your girlfriend or some such thing. The guys back there on the back row, they may have more important things to do, but that's okay. So let me tell you the answers before we get there. Some main points. Uh, here's what I want you to take away. Uh, number one, housing as an asset is unique. It has, it, it has two components. It has a consumption component and an investment component. A lot of what we hear about in the press and everywhere else is this part. How much money did we make or how much money did we lose? We, we, we don't talk a whole lot about the fact that you buy a house for consumption. Uh, so, so I want you to in your mind, I want you to start thinking about housing as, as, as two important components. And if you're ever going to go buy a house, here's my advice. If you call me on the phone and ask me, should I buy a house or not, here's what I will tell you. I will say, view housing as a consumption asset. Do not think about this side of the picture. If you start thinking about housing as an investment asset, you will make the wrong decision, in my opinion. You got to think about housing as a consumption aspect. I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Here's a quote. Uh, some of you may know where I took this quote from. Notice I put it in quotes. Anyone, any, anyone know where I got this quote from, by the way? In, 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 any of you read the church's material on sort of financial stuff? That's where this quote comes from, <laughs> OK? <laughs> this is essentially lifted from, from there. We have heard this, certainly as members of the church, we have heard this forever. At least I've heard it forever, as long as I've been alive, and that's forever in my mind so far, right? Uh, I've heard that it's okay to go in debt to buy, an, and I emphasized this word, modest. Uh, it was not in bold and italics in the original. I sort of did that. That goes along with the consumption side of, of the market. Last piece of advice. Be careful not to overconsume housing. There are huge incentives. There is strong peer pressure, certainly in the United States, to overconsume housing. And there are all types of incentives, particularly government incentives, to behave that way. We invest in the United States a huge amount of resources in housing, in housing this country. It's been a goal since, a federal goal since the late 1940s when it was first put in place to have a, started off being a modest, decent home for every American, quote unquote, and, quote, and it's sort of expanded out to having a McMansion for every, uh, for every person in the United States. All right, so I'll come back to these in a second. What makes housing unique? Four characteristics that I want you to think about. One is, the housing as an asset tends to be heterogeneous. Every house is unique, even though they're very similar. All houses have bathrooms. All houses have, most of them anyway, have bedrooms, etc. They all have square feet. They all have uh, various physical characteristics. But it tends to be heterogeneous. Housing is fixed in a location. It's the ultimate fixed in location asset. And what happens is you buy a house, you buy your neighbors. You rent an apartment, you rent your neighbors. All of us have been there, good or bad. Uh, fourth characteristic, housing as an asset tends to be thinly traded. Now what that translates into is that it tends to be an illiquid asset and it has high transactions cost. In order to get in and out of housing, is anywhere in the United States to get in is going to cost you between five and eight percent of the price of the house. To get out is going to, on average, cost you between seven and ten percent. So the total transactions cost on the purchase of a house is typically anywhere between fifteen and twenty percent. 
Now, if house prices are not increasing dramatically in one year, you're going to lose money instantaneously by buying a house simply because of the high transactions cost. What this also does is that we don't observe the same asset being traded in every time period, like we like say a, a share of stock in uh, Google or IBM or some other publicly traded um, stock. So what we observe is that if you want to think about a time series panel data set, so we have houses one through 100 and we observe years one through 10, if we look at that matrix, we only see a few houses being traded within that matrix. So what that implies is that as we're trying to discover prices about what's going on, it becomes an extremely difficult empirical task. I'll come back to that. Last but not least, there's a unique set of what I call institutional characteristics. Tax rules are different with respect to owner-occupied housing. Legal rules are different. Government programs are different. They're just all types of institutions that influence the housing market. View a house, again, as a bundle of services, size, location. Each of these characteristics yield utility. That is, I'm an economist, so what we would say is that uh, you buy a bathroom Right? So characteristic of a house is a bathroom and you get some services, some utility from that bathroom. And so you're willing to bid a price for the bathroom. You're willing to bid a price for the kitchen. You're willing to bid a price. So view a house as a, as a bundle of characteristics, all of which are priced individually. So the total price of the house is thus the sum of the price of the individual characteristics. So if home buyer A really values bathrooms a lot more than you do, they will pay more for bathrooms than you pay. Make sense? So the total price, and so what we're observing is, is, a, is one price that represents a composite of the price of all these individual characteristics. Um, the economists refer to this as a hedonic model. It, the, it comes from the idea of hedonism, which means pleasure, which means satisfaction, etc. So what happens is that we, we as consumers derive utility satisfaction from each of these individual characteristics and we put a price. So the theoretical model of housing that exists is that what we do is that we trade this bundle of characteristics. And one of the assumptions is that the housing market is complete enough such that you can go buy each one of these characteristics individually. So if you wanted three bathrooms instead of two bathrooms, you could go buy the additional bathroom in the housing market. All right. So with each of these unique characteristics, how do they influence the price of housing? Well, here's what you observe. The fact that it's heterogeneous leads to bargaining. Housing is next to cars, and we don't, even today, we don't bargain nearly as much as we used to on cars, but housing is one of the assets where we actually bargain. You go into the grocery store to buy a loaf of Wonder Bread, which is Wonder Bread in anywhere. It's exactly the same. There's, it's a homogeneous asset. We don't observe any bargaining. So what we observe in the marketplace is we typically observe more bargaining, the more heterogeneous an asset becomes. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, what it means is that if we observe the price of the house, that price has in it the bargaining strength of either the buyer or the seller. Depending upon how much strength the buyer and the seller has, and then the price of an individual asset will be affected by the bargaining strength. So if you put a strong bargainer on the buy side, against the weak bargainer on the sell side, you may observe the price higher than it normally, quote unquote, would be, or sort of the true price of the house or the market value of the house. Right. So if you want to think about house prices, your neighbor's house looks just or very similar to yours and you observe that it sold for X, one of the things you have to worry about is, is that would my house sell for that or is it because my neighbor happened to uh, 
get him, him or herself hooked up with a weak bargainer. Um, if I have time, I'll say some more about that later. But the fixity of location leads to the influence of these external effects on prices. So we have all kinds of externalities, both positive and negative. They don't have to be negative externalities. There could be positive externalities uh, embedded in the price of a house. The thinly traded, as I said earlier, leads to this issue of the difficulty in price discovery. That is trying to understand exactly what the true prices are. Remember, all we can ever observe is what the transactions price was. Uh, and last but not least, the institutional rules lead to, leads to a lot of what I refer to as non-market effects and risk. So stuff that's on the outside that's influencing the housing market, government programs, et cetera. We'll talk a few about a few of those in a, in a minute. All right, so what's the current situation? So here's my take on sort of where we are in U.S. housing markets. I'm going to show you a graph in just a second with 30 years of real house price data in, in the U.S. But before we go there, let me, let me go up to the side for 45 seconds talk about this idea of a, of a house price index. So if we want to track house prices in Provo, Utah, right, we go out and we observe individual house transactions in Provo, Utah. Now what we want to do is aggregate those together and build a, a price index. So we could say here's what the typical house or the average house or a regular house, etc., some kind of house in in Provo is doing. So is the, is the overall market going up, down, sideways, et cetera? So we, we, we spend a lot of time and energy, certainly on the research side in the last 30 to 40 years, housing economists like myself and others in this room, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to construct house price indices and trying to get the methodology to construct a house price in, index correct. See, the easiest way is to observe the same house. So I take Ned Hill's house and observe that it was bought in at time zero, and then that same house transacted one year later. So I say $100,000 in time zero, and then it sold for one hundred five dollars in the second time period, so I got exactly the same asset. So the house went up $5,000 or 5% 5 during that year. Right? That's called a repeat sale. So if I could observe repeat sales on the same house, Right? then I could presumably extract. The difficulty with that is the $5,000 increase, or 5% increase, is really composed of three components. Ned's house got one year older. That, that generally is a negative effect. We refer to that as depreciation. Believe it or not, houses wear out. Houses depreciate. That is, they lose value. The roof wears out. The plumbing goes bad. Mechanical systems begin to deteriorate, right? Cracks begin to appear, etc. The typical house in the United States depreciates on average two to two and a half percent a year. So if Ned's house was sort of typical, the five thousand dollar increase, right? <laughs> Part, he lost twenty five hundred dollars because he went down two and a half percent because of the age depreciation effect. Now suppose Ned had spent $2,500 in maintenance on his house between time zero and time one. So the second component is how much we actually invested in the house, how much the homeowner invested in the house between those two time periods. You with me? And then the third component is the market-wide influence. So trying to think about a, an index Right? Do we want a gross index? Do we want an index net of the maintenance? So Ned buys a house for $100,000. One year later, he sells it for $100,000. He spends $5,000 on maintenance. How much has he actually made on the house during that time period? Well, his house has remained constant, right? Maybe he spent just enough to offset the depreciation. So building a price index is not a simple task, but let's assume that we can do it. Right. As an economist would say, we assume that we can do this and sort of get it right. So here's a graph. Since roughly 1975, 
So for about the last 35 years, sort of what the real price of housing has done over the last 35 years. Notice that for this time period, prices went up, went down, et cetera, right? In general, this is about three to, excuse me, to about 0.3 to, to a half a percent a year. Some other work I've done with some other people, we did some long run price index calculations. Uh, from about 1980, we calculated in another series until about the year 2000, we calculated. Uh, real house prices in the U.S. went up about a half a percent. One percent if you wanted to put the outside, right? which is about equal to the population growth, by the way, in the United States. So everything in the U.S., notice house prices go up, house prices come down. If you buy a house, there's a good probability that sometimes the price is going to go up and then again it may go down. Until we hit, in the U.S., until we hit about 1998, 1999, right here, right, things begin to change. Then house prices shot up dramatically from their long-run historical pattern until about 2006, which is right there. Then they fell off the cliff. Okay, so we, uh, we went up dramatically and we went down. Uh, we have time, we'll come back and talk a little bit about what's going on uh, there. So here's, he, here's a brief summary. I'm not gonna read all this to you, I'll let you go read it later on. A few acronyms. OFHEO is the old Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight. Those were the, it's called, it's pronounced OFEO. OFEO was the government entity designed to watch Fannie and Freddie. Everyone know who Fannie and Freddie was? Or Fan and Fred, as they've been abbreviated now. Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation and the Federal National Mortgage Corporation. Those were the government entities who claimed for the last 30 years that they were not government entities, despite the fact that all of us knew that they were government entities, despite the fact that they argued, we got plenty of capital, if things go bad, no worries. These are the same entities for which you and I have taxpayers have only spent $100 billion in the last year. And the projection is, it's probably going to be three to 400 billion before it's over with because the default rate on their mortgages is increasing <coughs> extremely fast and the losses that they're going to build up are going to be pretty large anyway. Long story, more about that if somebody wants to talk about it. OFEA was the entity, the auditors who were supposed to watch the auditors who watch the auditors who watch the auditors, right? I mean, it's the entity who watches the entity who watches the entity. Uh, uh, post 2000, what we saw was that Wall Street became very aggressive in what was referred to as mortgage-backed securities. Particularly, what was known as some subprime mortgage-backed securities. So, what we saw was that the quote subprime were the high-risk mortgage loans. When the economy began to go soft, etc., were the first to start going into default. Um, Wall Street had uh, been very aggressive. The government, the GSEs, the government-sponsored entities, Fannie and Freddie, became more aggressive. Uh, I gave a speech uh, this past summer over in Europe about the macro effects, and uh, that's another lecture for another day as to who's to blame. There's plenty of blame for everybody. Uh, uh, suffice it to say that a lot of it has to do with our great congressmen and women, uh, but we won't go there today. Uh, in 2006, prices turn, turned, the submarket crashed, and what we refer to as prime mortgages uh, begin to follow it. Uh, I'll show you some more data on defaults in just a few minutes on uh, uh, mortgages these days. Here's a little graph. This will almost show you about outside the U.S., but these are various countries, uh, Great Britain, Ireland, Sweden, France, Spain, 
notice that they all had relatively large increases, Ireland being the biggest, relatively rapid price increases starting in the late 90s until about 2005, 2006. I was in Spain this past summer uh, talking about housing markets and the Spanish market was really taking a beating, uh, still is. Uh, so notice that their pattern of house prices looks fairly similar to ours. Let me show you two graphs. I wish I could get away from the mic, but I won't. Let me show you two graphs, which I think are extremely interesting. This is a house price series for uh, what we'll call the most volatile housing markets in the U.S. So Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, New York, Boston, okay? Let me show you the next graph. Look at that graph. The 10 least volatile housing markets in the U.S., okay? Wichita, Kansas, Fort Worth, Texas, Dallas, Texas, Memphis, Tennessee, Indianapolis. You want to see it again? Which market would you rather live in? I won't, I won't press my finance colleagues here to tell me which one they think would be the most, but it's clear that some markets are much more risky than other markets, right? Someone should ask me later on, well, what, what causes this anticipating question? One of the main causes of this really increased volatility across these markets, if you study these markets very much, most of these markets have really severe natural and or man-made barriers to entry. That is, they really restrict the land market for housing, either through strict man-made barriers like zoning ordinances, growth control ordinances, etc., or they have fairly severe natural barriers and or both, which means that the supply side is relatively inelastic so when it's bouncing around on the demand side. Whereas these markets tend to have fairly elastic supply side. Moral, part of the moral here is that not all markets in the U.S. look like this. Some of them look like that. If you live in this one versus that one, your strategy might be different, depending on how you want it to behave. Okay, so the current state. Uh, down about 25 to 30% from the peak in 2006. Prices today are roughly what they were in most housing markets, roughly what they were in 2003. Question, have they stabilized? Answer. Well, one of the most widely quoted house price series is what's referred to as the Case Shiller Price Index, named after two economists, Carl Case and Bob Shiller. Uh, so what they do is that they build a price index for cities in the U.S., which they track every month and release a price index. In the last several months, there has been some price stabilization in a lot of the markets with some slight upturn in some. Question, is that real, quote unquote? That is, are we at the bottom? Is it turning? Answer, my answer, probably not. Since some of the house activity is due to recent government programs, particularly a housing tax credit program designed to motivate in the beginning first-time home buyers the most recent version of that is to motivate all of us to go buy a house practically everyone in this room most likely if you wanted to go buy a house now could qualify for this the new version of the housing tax credit maybe a few exceptions i don't think those programs are a going to last forever and all what they're doing is slowing down the decline. Now, that's not a bad thing. It could be a good thing to try to slow down. But while I don't have any evidence, who wins from the housing tax credit? Let's go back to the original first-time homebuyer. 
who won from the six or eight thousand dollar housing tax credit? Let me ask the question this way: Who went? Who won from the automobile clunker program? Was it the car buyer? No, the evidence shows there. I just read a, read a report, really well done, where the guy looked at car prices around the clunker. According to his calculations, only about a third of the clunker benefit was actually passed through to the car buyer. The other two thirds went to car seller. So what's happening is that if you go buy one, all, what's happening is that you're not going to really benefit very much. The, price of the house is just the tax credit is going to be capitalized then. Now I have no empirical evidence yet to show that that's the case. But everything I've done in my career with capitalization of these kinds of things, programs and house prices shows that that's the case. Now I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's, if I own the house, I would like for my house to be prop, house price to be propped up. If I didn't own a house, I would prefer the house prices continue to fall, maybe, and benefit from that. Okay. doing for time okay so let, 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 let me talk about two implications of the house price decline the first one is what we refer to in the economics literature as the wealth effect here's the story homeowners feel and actually they are less wealthy and less likely to spend on consumption when the price of their house goes down so if you owned a house and the price fell and you believe that the price had fallen, then you're, whether you sell or not, boys and girls, you're less wealthy. Okay? Some people argue you got to sell, and, but in my opinion, you're less wealthy. So price goes down, so you're less wealthy. You don't spend as much, so that leads to a decline in consumer spending which leads to more decline in the economy. Now the evidence shows that the propensity to spend out of increased housing wealth is two or three times as big as the propensity to spend out of an increase in wealth from the stock market. All the studies that have tried to disentangle the wealth effect finds that the propensity to spend out of housing wealth is much higher. So what happens is that house prices go down, and to some extent that's why policymakers are extremely worried, right? If we observe that house prices are falling fairly dramatically, then that will begin to put a drag on the rest of the economy. So what we would like is to, is to convince you that your house price really hasn't fallen. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain who's telling you that house prices have gone down. Okay, pay no attention to that. Every piece of data I want to release will try to convince you, if I'm on one side of the fence, that house prices really haven't fallen, and they haven't fallen very much. Uh, second implication is about mortgages. There are about 50 million homeowners in the U.S. with a first mortgage, give or take a million or two. Recent data from Moody'sEconomy.com and the Deutsche Bank estimate that about 15 to 17 million are currently underwater. I just read another report you might have seen it uh, somewhere on, in the Wall Street Journal, I think within the last week. The big headline was one in six. One in four. One in four. So, you know, uh, it's, it's whatever the number, it's a relatively big number. Now, what do we mean by underwater? Well, what we mean here is that these borrowers, the value of their house, is less than the amount of mortgage debt that they owe. So they're underwater. Um, some sources estimate that it could be close to 40% by the time house prices stabilize in 2010. A lot of homeowners out there owe more than the house is worth. Now, why do we care about this? Well, here's why we care. If you take out a mortgage on a house, in finance jargon, you have what is known as an option. And what you really have 
is a put option. You have the option to put the house to the lender. That is, you can go to the lender or mail the lender the keys to the house and say, here, the house is yours. So when you take out that debt, embedded in that mortgage debt is an option. Now, I'll sh show you another slide in just a second. What, one of the big risks here is how many homeowners are going to start out of this, I mean, suppose it's only 10 million and it's not 17 million. Suppose it's only 5 million, it's still a big number. How many of those homeowners are going to begin to exercise their option to default on the mortgage? Now here's what you discover. In some states, lenders, if you default on your mortgage and the house sells for less than the mortgage, lenders can put what's known as a deficiency judgment against you. So you sell this house for 100,000, pick on Ned again, Ned owes 120, so he's got 20%, I mean 20,000, right? The house only sold for 100 and he owed 120. In some states, the lender could could put a deficiency judgment against net and go after other assets that he has. In other states, they don't have that option. So which states do you think are beginning to have the highest default rates? And it'll take a genius to figure this out, right? Because uh, there's more benefit in a state where there's a non-deficiency clause. Now, if every state in the U.S. suddenly decided they wanted to pass a deficiency judgment clause, what do you think politicians would do? How much crying and screaming would there be about gouging homeowners, right? So it's, it's a real touchy situation, but um, the potential default on all these mortgages is really high. The risk is high. Now the reason we also worry about that is that what we find is that houses that go into default sell for less than houses not in default, but since we don't know what the price of the house house that's not in default would sell for, right? If there are no transactions, we cannot observe any price discovery. So the market begins to extract the prices for the defaulted houses as the correct price. And indeed, they may be the correct price. Remember those external effects, right? House cross street sells. It was in default and it sold. That's going to have an influence on, and all the evidence shows that that's the case. All the evidence shows that, there's, that these mortgage defaults cause external effects on prices surrounding them. Independent of whether or not they've been vandalized and independent of, what, or, uh, of uh, whether or not the homeowner ripped out all the doors and all that sort of stuff on the way out, which by the way, some homeowners do. Uh, so. Uh, Bottom line, lots of risk. I think that nationally, again, this is Sermon's opinion or whatever it's worth, I think that nationally we'll see house prices probably falling another 5%. And if we're lucky, they'll stabilize in 2010. Of course, the other major question is, since the price of housing is highly dependent upon income, which is dependent upon jobs, this is the big question that's overhanging the national economy right now, that about job growth. Let me say a word too about this and then, I, then I'll give, open it up to some questions here in just a second. Certainly in the U.S., <laughs> houses become piggy banks. We, we, we tend to view our house, and, and, and I'm not arguing against it. it it's, it's really good that our financial system has made it possible such that we can borrow against our assets. You can't do that in every country in the world, by the way. I mean, the financial markets aren't complete enough. So we, we live in a market economy where the financial markets are really complete. And if there's money to be made, uh, suppliers, I figured out a way to uh, set it up. So one of the things that we've done in the U.S. has made it real easy to view our house as a piggy bank. And we've set up incentives. In the old days, you bought a car, 
with a car loan, you could deduct the interest, right? Remember those old days? There are a few of us in here old enough to remember those old days. They decided to pass, reform the tax so you couldn't do that anymore. What do you think happened? The interest on mortgages tax deductible. What do we as consumers have a tendency to do? Start borrowing as much as we conceivably can against our house, right? Because the interest over there is tax deductible and on the car loan it's not. So we borrow against our house to do what? Buy a car. Then we create lines of credit against our house. That's why I call it piggy bank, right? So we, so we go over there and set ourselves up a line of credit whether or not we're going to use it. Most of us go set ourselves up a line of credit just in case we ever wanted to borrow against our house. And the transactions costs are pretty, pretty low. Um, lots of incentives to do things with houses that we normally would not do. And as long as life is good and all's well, everything works. But when things aren't good and all's not well, it begins to unravel and begins to fall apart. So what's the future? Mm -hmm. Well, three scenarios. Overall economy improves, employment gets better, house prices go up, probably at some modest level. Probability not very high, in my opinion. Second possibility, overall economy stagnates, prices bounce around on the bottom for several years. I've lived in two housing market areas. When I taught at LSU, when I lived in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge house prices collapsed right after I bought there. They bounced around on the bottom for nine years. Actually, yeah, until I decided to move prices went up. So wherever I'm buying a house, don't go there is the moral of that story. I moved to New England. House prices in New England had fallen 50% between 1988 and 1990. They were almost at the bottom when I got there in 1991. They bounced around on the bottom for eight years until 1997, 1998. Then they started back up modestly. Last possibility, current government programs that's propping up the market sort of fade out. We get tired of spending all this money, bailing out all sorts of people. Mortgage defaults increase, prices decline more. Here's what I believe. And I think the probability of this happening is pretty high. Now, we have seen recently some more serious attempts to solve this, but this is a huge problem. This mortgage default potential is a huge problem. And I'm not certain we can throw enough money at it to, uh, to solve it. So what does it all mean? Well, I'm back to where I started. Housing is unique. I hope I've convinced you of that. If you're going to buy a house and go in debt, buy the house, view it from a consumption perspective. Will it make you happier? Will it make your wife happier? Will it make your kids better off, et cetera? Look at all those consumption aspects of what's, what a house brings to the table. I tell them all my students, they're going to go buy a house. They'll come in, they'll say, Professor Sermons, uh, we're thinking about buying a house. And I say, OK, so here's the way I think you should think about it. Are you going to be happier such that you'll be more willing to get out of bed tomorrow morning? go to your job and be a lot more productive, in which case you'll make a lot of money off of being productive in your job and your house help contribute to that. Or perhaps uh, your kids will be better off uh, because they're in a more stable environment. But that's the, those are consumption aspects of thinking about the house purchase decision. Try not to overconsume. Try not to overconsume. Do your best, particularly the young people in here when you go out into the housing market. Do your best to convince your spouse and and those people who are working with you, that you really don't want to overconsume housing. Despite the fact that they will tell you, take out a bigger mortgage because the interest is tax deductible. I always respond, so let me get this right. 
I pay an extra $500 in order to deduct $200, so I'm in the hole $300 in order to get a bigger tax deduction. Okay, I think that makes sense in somebody's world, but it doesn't make sense in my world, I say. So try not to overconsume. Thank you for your attention.